Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the uh, sixth um, Cyber Week event from RunSafe. Uh, we're going to give people a few minutes to get uh, joined in. Hopefully, it's been a, a good Cyber Week for everybody. We're excited about this discussion. We'll uh, give it another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll get underway. Right. Well, uh, thanks for coming this afternoon um, or morning, wherever you happen to be. Um, so what I wanted to do is we'll kind of set the stage and um, maybe if you, Jeff, could you kick off our polls um, while I cycle through a few things, there'll be a couple of questions that come up. But um, as I, I'm sorry, say again. I uh, just started the poll right now. All right, brilliant, thank you. Um, so uh, Run Safe, this has been a, a great uh, cybersecurity um, Cyber Week event. A series for us. Uh, we had great discussions in 5G. We had discussions in cloud workloads, DevSecOps, and now we're looking at the software supply chain. And that was uh, five of the six events for the week for us. And then we had uh, a really fun event, which was a trivia tournament. And I'll, if I could ask Joe to uh, tell us, you know, uh, you know, walk through a little bit of that because it was supporting a really great cause. Thank you, Doug. And yes, we had uh, the, the inaugural uh, Run Safe trivia tournament on Tuesday of this week uh, with competing cybersecurity companies uh, who were vying for the coveted Run Safe uh, trivia cup and also the mon to earn the moniker of the smartest cyber company in the world. And we're pleased to announce that Hypercube was the winner of the trivia tournament challenge this year. So Hypercube, congratulations. But also as part of the contest, uh, we uh, raised $8,000 and $8,000 goes towards uh, uh, the Atlantic Council Cyber Statecraft Program called, or C Cyber Statecraft Initiative Program called the Cyber 912 Strategy Challenge. And today we have Mr. Trey Herr, who uh, is here on our panel today. Uh, who is the director of the Cyber Statecraft Initiative. And so on behalf of RunSafe and all the cyber uh, security companies, Trey, we'd like to uh, say thank you for what the Cyber 912 Strategy Challenge does to help develop uh, future leaders in, in cyber policy and strategy. And we're, we're honored that you're a part of our panel today, but also aligned with you uh, in, in following all of your research as an organization. So on behalf of RunSafe Security and the the, the trivia tournament, uh, you know, thank you very much, Trey, for all the work that your team does uh, within the Cyber Statecraft Initiative. And thank you for having us. And and again, I think from all of the team as well over here, a massive thank you guys for the gratitude and uh, to the gift. This is going to be something we use during the year on our supporting the Cyber Nature 12 Trinity Challenge, but also through the Next Gen um, Fund, where we're trying to bring a more diverse workforce into that challenge. So I look forward to using that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, so um, the, uh, the our setup is that the attendees uh, can post questions to the panel, and uh, we've got uh, a team here ready to, to jump into those. Um, and if you raise your hand, we can uh, promote you to a uh, to, to be able to speak. Um, and if you are uh, discussing anything on uh, social media, you can um, hashtag CyberWeek and call out uh, RunSafe. Um, so quick overview of RunSafe. Um, and what we do, is we immunize your software without developer friction across embedded systems, open source, and cr cloud workloads. And we do this by taking unprotected software uh, that could be either binaries or uh, source code, driving it through our, transfer our transformation engine which then lays in um, 
protections that passively uh, block you know, memory corruption based zero days. We can get added in at the build time or directly in the binary. And we have our, our repo offering is able to apply these methods without, um, even if you're not running development, um, directly into uh, your open source software. And, and, and that's actually where things get, you know, it's particularly poignant for this discussion related to open source and, and software supply chains. So um, today's discussion uh, really is about, um, really is about uh, the software supply chain. So I'm gonna, you know, I'll walk through uh, each of our panelists, ask them to, uh, to introduce themselves, but I just, you know, wanna just start with the question of, you know, who really writes everything? When they sit down and, and create a project, you know, if they create a web app, you know, who who is writing the HTTP daemon that is then, and then they're writing the scripting that goes on top of it. And then are they, did they write the script interpreter? Did they, you know, did they write the operating system that the, the daemon goes on? So, you know, nobody, you know, almost nobody is writing everything from top to bottom anymore. And so that's really the, the framework of this discussion. And so if you're, if you're, getting software, how are you getting confident that that software is, uh, that you can have confidence in it? Um, so, and we've got, you know, as our, our, our attendees are, have organizations that have varying sizes, you know, five to 10 people, 11 to 15 people, um, and they're running a variety of open source packages, as few as six, but as many as a hundred, you know, more than a hundred open source packages across their organization. So. You know, let's let's kind of dig into that. So if I can, I'll I'll introduce or I'll ask Trey uh, to introduce him help himself, and then um, Lori, and then um, Mr. Bray of uh, the CEO of Phylum. We could ask you, each of you guys to introduce yourselves, and then we can jump into some questions. So Trey, if you don't mind. Excellent. Yeah, happy to get into it. So uh, my name is Trey Her. I run the Cyber Statecraft Initiative at the Atlanta Council, uh, where we work on all manner of excitement uh, in the cyber policy space. The project that we, uh, I think, have, have really dug into most recently, part of the reason we're, we're here talking today is um, an initiative that we launched in June called Breaking Trust, which profiled 115 different attacks and disclosures across the software supply chain running from 2010 to 2020. Um, and I'll say at the top, I think that what, what was most interesting about that effort, or at least the findings coming out of that effort, was that the open source ecosystem has been a tremendous asset um, to the rate of innovation and to the uh, scope of innovation across the software ecosystem that we have folks combining to um, create functionality and to interleave different products in ways that weren't ever conceived of by uh, their designers and, and major technology companies open sourcing significantly invested in projects and research activities um, and adding those to the ecosystem as well. At the same time that many of these projects are um, secured poorly or not secured well throughout their full life cycle, making them an attractive part of the attack surface um, for companies and for operators whose, whose ecosystem themselves includes open source software, which is effectively everyone. And so the data set finds 25 different attacks and disclosures running in that 2010 to 2020 timeframe, targeting open source libraries, libraries that uh, were poorly secured, libraries that were um, not checking to see and, and validating inputs and commits uh, from different users very well. And what's interesting about it, I think at least for this discussion, I'll, I'll close on this is just to say, the, the, the processes that we've had and the, the standards and controls that we tend to apply in thinking about software development, software security, are, are closer to modeled on uh, a single organization building proprietary software in a waterfall methodology. And so as we're seeing more and more people move into the agile development space, as we're seeing the development base fragment where code is coming from, who code is being built by, diversifies radically, even for large enterprise organizations and large enterprise line of business applications. Um, the significance of trying to apply a software, a secure software development lifecycle to a thousand entities over whom you have control over maybe 20 becomes a really challenging task. And, and more in that development, actually maintaining that security throughout the life cycle of that code with this disparate development base um, creates some really interesting challenges. So how to capture those benefits while also being realistic about the security challenges, I think will be a, a fun part of the conversation today. Uh, 
Brilliant. Thank you, Trey. Um, uh, Dr. Williams, if you could uh, give us a crash course on you. Sure. So I'm a professor at North Carolina State University, been there 20 years now, um, worked at IBM before that. Um, and we do a lot of work in software security. So the intersection of uh, software engineering and security. Um, some recent things related to open source, um, uh, a couple of studies, one, you know, one, one study was done specifically on memory corruption vulnerabilities. Um, in, and we were in a partnership with RunSafe. And so some of the, the biggest findings of that showed that um, a lot of the vulnerabilities in Linux is, is a product we were analyzing. 40% of the vulnerabilities that were found by tools were memory corruption related. So a very big overrepresentation of memory corruption vulnerabilities. And then um, looking at the CVEs, uh, based upon those, we found a very small percentage, I think 2.5% of the C memory related CVEs would have been found by a tool. So, that, you know, that, that's a scary thing. You know, it, it shows that we really do need to improve our tools in order to detect vulnerabilities. It's, it's something that's good about RunSafe is, you know, it protects it at runtime. Um, so that's one. Uh, we also ran another large uh, where we, a large study where we did penetration testing versus static analysis versus dynamic analysis or fuzzing versus interactive testing. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately the clear winner in all of that was penetration testing. And these were done by graduate students, um, found many more times the vulnerabilities than the tools did. Um, and that's just, it's a concern because what we really want is for tools to be able to be put into a DevOps kind of tool chain and to be able to find those vulnerabilities. But you know, at this point, it really is still saying that humans need to be in the loop, um, which, which is unfortunate because we're you know, the least scalable and the most expensive. Um, as far as specific vulnerability types, still a lot of cross-site scripting, still a lot of cross-site request forgery. Um, this doesn't, and the supply chain may not matter as much, but a lot of checked in secrets so people are checking in API keys and cryptography keys and um, just database keys. So that's a, a prevalent problem um, that needs to be addressed. Um, something that does relate to the supply chain are vulnerable components. Uh, and there are increasingly tools out there that will notify someone that one of their open source components that they brought into their project has is vulnerable but also they don't do anything about it. And so, you know, we, we just completed a large study where we compared the tools and, you know, the, the sad truth of it is we ran 10 different tools on to, that would notify which components were vulnerable and none of them said the same thing. Um, and we don't really know what the ground truth is, but we do know that the, um, it's tough. The signals are tough for people to know what to do. And we're really moving towards both for the secrets and for the vulnerable components. How do we bring risk into the equation? Um, you know, and sometimes you check in the secret, it doesn't matter. And other, and other times you're giving away the keys to the kingdom. How do we notify the developer? Pay, really pay attention to this one. This one's really dangerous. And then similar with vulnerable components, like make sure you actually update this one. This is a really popular one. This is struts. This is this is really attractive to a hacker. Make sure that you actually update that. So that, that's highlights of the types of things we're doing lately. No, and that's a phenomenal intro, Aaron, uh, for for you you sir. Uh, and actually, I'll make sure you know you and you and Lori should probably uh, collaborate because I think maybe maybe Phylum should be one of the next set of tools that are in her studies. But if uh, why don't I get out of your way, sir, and um, introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you so much um, for having me here. And so I'm Aaron. Uh, I spent uh, quite a bit of time working in the U.S. government slash Intel community. Uh, I spent some time a few other places, but now I'm the CEO at Phylum. And fundamentally, we're trying to change the conversation around supply chain and supply chain security to be less focused on simply vulnerabilities and more focused on the overall risk that open source software and third party packages bring to your uh, supply chain and, and ultimately to your products and organization. Well, excellent. And so what I'm going to do um, is uh, I'm going to share the results of our, our polls um, and then we can start um, start a discussion. I'll, I'll lob some questions um, in and 
but we've got teams that are, you know, to mid-size, you know, five to 10 people on their development uh, projects and uh, 11 to 15. Um, and using, again, a range of uh, product sizes or a range of variety of products. And people are using, uh, in, in their protections, they're using exploit mitigation, uh, software testing, and, and patch management. So now what I think is the really interesting question here is, and then we'll we'll come back to this. But if you think you've if you think your developer size is five to ten, and you're using open source, you're really the number of people who have commit access to your code is actually hundreds. So, uh, and I know I know that uh, Aaron has those figures in, with more precision, but when and we'll get to that. But um, all right, so why don't I uh, start with uh, Trey? Um, so. You know, the talking about the things that make open source code scary, it could just be a, a really clever way for the cybersecurity industry to make itself relevant. Um, I mean, a, a fantastically manufactured red herring. So, you know, what what would you say to that? I'd say it's a really useful question um, because I think it's something the industry is constantly in the, in the hunt for is the next big thing. Uh, that they can build a product or a next-gen offering around. So it's, a, it's an entirely legitimate question. I think we think about open source, I'd say two things. One is it's not new. Um, it's not novel in that, in that the challenges that we're thinking about are scaling factors from you know, basic structural precepts that have been there for you know, 15, 20 years um, longer, realistically, when you think about the history of, of um, collaborative so uh, software development. But the, the implication that we have now is that some of these open source projects are underpinning the security of the internet, that they are um, critical to a security function that's being used by a major um, defense organization or, or public or private sector organization. Um, and so the significance or the criticality of those programs is evolving in the way that they're being used. This is both an inevitability to some extent of, of this being a successful and innovative ecosystem, but also something that requires uh, measure change. The second piece to your question, I think, in terms of the industry, and it's a good one, is really what can we solve with products and services? Um, there are questions around awareness. Um, you know, one of the things that we found in talking to folks for uh, this Breaking Trust project was just the number of organizations uh, that were aware of and conscious and willing to talk about how they used open source versus how many uh, did and, and didn't know it was striking. Uh, and I think it's one of the most recurring and compelling pitches um, is really just to be able to understand your own inventory of code, uh, right? Not just in terms of assets, but actual dependencies um, on products that you use that might have secondary or tertiary dependencies in the open source ecosystem. Um, so that's an area where there's a product or service, I think, potential. The other that jumps out is, um, and this is an evolving space, but thinking about how to robustly manage the life cycle of all those different products and dependencies, right? It's, it's one thing to ask a developer that is, a grad student and their dog in a dorm somewhere in Hamburg, it's building some really interesting code to notify you every time they have a fix for their software. It's another thing for you to rely on that, uh, that dependency and that sort of push notification for a really critical product or service that you've got SLAs built on top of. So one of the opportunity spaces, I think that you're starting to see people move into is not just inventorying, but actively trying to manage the life cycle of those products and proactively address security flaws, um, either when they're detected and notified by the developer or before that, right? And actually getting outside of that, that development curve. Um, and that's something where there are, there are technical and there are service opportunities. The, the caveat I give to all that is, as with any security tooling, it all relies on the maturity of the organization that's implementing it. And open, you know, sort of second order open source vulnerabilities are, are probably not a lot of people's first uh, problem, right? You know, one of the things I, I love this, you know, people talk about um, bug bounties, right? And like, you can put a bounty out there for products that you're building, thinking about developers as opposed to users here. But if you don't have the capacity to actually mitigate the vulnerabilities that are coming in through that process and make some use out of all of that crowdsourced intelligence about the security of your platform, it doesn't really make a lot of financial sense for you to be shelling out tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to find those flaws. So the, the way that these tools become useful is as part of a maturing security organization, not necessarily as a, as a single line of defense and certainly not as a magic bullet. 
So, thank you, Trey. And so you found, I mean, if you don't mind, um, maybe we can pull one vignette like you. So you found, you know, in the data and I did drop a, the link to the study in the chat. So if anybody wants to go take a look at it, you're, you're welcome, please. Um, but it, there are, you know, definite examples where you can see, and I think they're called out in the study of people using open source to to place things in targets and then weaponize those. I mean, so that that is documented. It's an it's it's a resolved question. Attackers do it. They do absolutely. So there's there's an example from uh, the paper that I like. I think because it's got such a, a wide attack. It's got a wide blast radius. Um, somebody slipped in a uh, a renamed library in the Ruby on Rails framework. Um, and actually, in, in four different instances, rewrote a gem and included some malicious code and a backdoor into it. It got pulled down 500 times in the last instance, this March 2019 attack, before one developer just happened to be auditing that portion of the code noticed the change. Um, so the, the, the pitch with open source is that it's got this huge potential attack surface. Lots of people are using these repositories are leveraging these, um, these code ecosystems. The flip side and what we observe, just kind of interesting is that the consequences associated with those attacks are not yet catastrophic. It's a lot of people loading in back doors for some future reconnaissance, some future exploitation. A lot of people throwing um, crypto mining code into products and hoping people run them on their systems and don't detect them. What we haven't seen yet is a lot of instances of highly capable actors using this pathway uh, as, a, as a path into well-protected systems and organizations. That's going to happen. It happens sporadically now. It will grow over time. So that's just a matter of, uh, of, of time, I think, and evolution. It's not that there's anything structural that prevents that. Yeah, no, uh, thank you. Thank you. And actually, Aaron, you know, I think that jumps right into, um, you know, Phylum's uh, wheelhouse. I mean, so if you could, you know, what, you know, what, a, what evidence uh, do you see of um, Trey's observations and, and how, you know, what is the kind of analysis that, that Phylum is doing that helps you observe that? Great question, Doug. So at a high level, I think, you know, just to kind of piggyback on what Trey said, the reason that we're starting to see so much more prevalence of, of these problems is that the ecosystems have just grown to such a high degree over the last couple of years. If we look at, you know, NPM and JavaScript in isolation, we had 12,500 packages in the repository five years ago in 2015, and we're at nearly 1.4 million today, and it just continues to grow. And, you know, to his point about how these attacks are sort of executed and discovered today, I don't really think that a lack of evidence of attacks necessarily indicates that they're not happening, because the entire mechanism for finding these things today is almost entirely new. Um, we're seeing a lot of things like typo squatting, which is you know where attackers will take and fork a package, and they'll try and get it into as many projects as possible. Um, you know, so for example, we found a couple flavors of a particular package where attackers had, where people had transposed um, two of the letters of the package name, and you know these packages are certainly getting pulled in and used because they're getting hundreds or thousands of downloads a day, and even if the content of those packages isn't malicious today, because in some cases they're direct forks of the original, they're manufactured in such a way that they've essentially mirrored, you know, the, the entire original repository. They've got all of the links and documentation set up so that unless you're very, you know, observe, very observant of, um, of what you're looking at, you're never going to notice that, you know, you've grabbed the wrong package essentially. Uh, and so in the future, that opens you up to, to just about anything. And so what we're really working on is providing mechanisms to sort of scale up the analysis of these, of these packages and, and ecosystems uh, to be able to sort of detect that behavior at scale. And so when you see, if somebody pulls in just one package, for example, and, and let's say they, they think they've got limited um exposure to op to this kind of risk they're like well you know i know i know that i'm going to bring in some open source but i'm going to i'm going to try and keep my risk limited by only pulling in one package or something let's let's say that that's a a mindset you know what does what have you guys seen in terms of all right 
fine. So it's it's a discrete package. It's only a couple of thousand in in and of itself. Maybe it's a couple of thousand source lines of code. It doesn't sound too bad. But but then you know you showed me some charts about dependencies, and then then things blow up. So Absolutely. so take me through that for just a second. Absolutely. So that that's also a great question, and that's the really sort of insidious thing about this problem, right? you pull in, let's just use React as an example, because that was one of the first case studies we did in the JavaScript ecosystem. So, you know, for those who are unaware, it's a super popular package. It was developed by Facebook. It's used by organizations, large and small all over the world. Um, if you pull in that package by itself, it has, I think, something like three or four sort of first order dependencies, things that direct it directly depends on. And, if, you know, a few development dependencies. But if you sort of walk that back to the edge and pull in the dependencies of those dependencies and the dependencies of those dependencies, you end up with nearly 7,000 possible packages that you're pulling in just by adding a single library um, to your build process. And to make matters even worse, you're not going to get 7,000 packages by just installing that library. You're going to get a different composition of that graph depending on what packages and versions you already have installed because most of these package managers and open source um, repositories rely on things like semantic versioning, where you may have multiple versions of the package that could satisfy a dependency requirement. No, thanks. That, that's, uh, is, it's unsettling, um, you know, again, because it goes back to the point when you think, you think you've got five or 10 people on your team that, are, that have commit access to your, to your code, it's not, it's a, it's a misleading data point. Um, so, so Lori, let's, you know, if, if you don't mind, you know, we've done, we've collaborated a bit and there are testing tools. And so you've got, let's even if we don't assume malicious intent on the part of the developer, um, what have you seen in terms of the behavior around developers when they're trying to, you know, improve code, they, they do some testing and how, you know, how quickly are things improving and how, how quickly, do, you know, once vulnerabilities are identified, how, how, what's it look like for that to work its way through um, into deployed software? Yeah, so I'll say still, we don't see the developers being as responsive as they can be um, to security. Um, you know, we see even when a tool has an alert and we can look through time, it could take you know, two months, three months, a year, multiple years, when that developer is getting that alert again and again and again. So, um, and, you know, still see the security group, you know, the people who are telling people what they did. Um, and in a way, the developers not paying attention as much as they could. But then I'll say on the other hand, um, I think you could go back to the security group and ask them, like, are they really providing risk-based information to the developers. Uh, you know, it, I've seen organizations where like they'll tell the developers, you have to fix 100% of these things. And then the developers are like, uh, not exactly. And then they kind of don't do much, but if they actually just said, these five are super important, you need to take care of these five, um, then the developers would probably um, react. Um, but, but currently still I see um, you know, the security mindset of everything's important, which it is, it is, everything is important. Any vulnerability could be taken advantage of, but yet some are risky, more risky than others. And I think that the coming together um, between the developers and the security groups, maybe in the sec DevOps manner, um, would really need to incorporate risk much more than it does today. Have there been, uh, and this actually, this is, I, I kind of love it to anybody, you know, so we've talked about DevSecOps previously this week, you know, and, and Trey, I think you observed things still seem very waterfall-ish, um, but is, is DevOps making its way into um, open source development much? I, I yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think that it is. Um, you know, some it is, and and I see it more in smaller organizations than larger, uh, where the partnership can be tighter. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, Trey, any other, have you, have you guys observed anything about how uh, developers supporting some of the open source packages are, you know, using any, any a different model? Nothing systematic. I mean, I'll only say that I, I think most of the discussion that you hear about DevSecOps presumes an organizational model where you have distinct teams and functions that you're trying to combine in this way. And for a lot of open source projects, there's, there's not quite so much structure. Um, so, so who, who the dev and the sec and the ops are may all be the same person. It may change day to day. So I think you could say that they are, but it, in some ways it's a language and it's a model developed for, uh, for larger organizations with some of those silos to be combined and, and decomposed. Yeah. So one model that I've seen, um, and some, but again, maybe larger open source projects is that when they, when there's a realization that a new feature has security implications, um, that they'll mark it off with a feature flag, like so they won't let it be available externally until there actually has been a check. So you can go through a normal DevOps pipeline with that, you know, security rele relevant area not visible. And then when a security expert has said, yeah, it looks okay to me, then they'll open up the feature flag and let the feature um, come out. And, and to me, that, you know, I was like, okay, that's how you can have a DevOps pipeline and also care about security at the same time. Um, okay. So actually we've got a question for you, Lori, from the audience. Um, so what, what methodology, so you, you said that there's a, a challenge sometimes when things are presented uh, to developers um, to figure out what to work on first. I mean, what methodologies have you seen or are out there to help rank vulnerabilities for developers? Like what would you, how would they figure out what to focus on? What should they do there? Right, it's it's hard. I mean, you know, and so that's a research area that we're working on is risk-based, you know, like how do, how do we handle this from a risk-based standpoint? I mean, I, I think that what happens now that is risk related is developers naturally will uh, care more about a penetration testing result than care about some kind of a dynamic tool result and have very little concern for a static analysis result because they're looking to see is this actually exploitable and the more that you can show the developer that it is exploitable um, the more likely they are to care about it um, we do have which you know is, is probably a longer discussion that I won't fully answer here, but I did develop a, a process called protection poker, which is similar to planning poker, if you know Agile, and it gets at a collaborative way to do threat modeling, abuse case kind of analysis, um, which would be able to numerically show what is riskier than something else. Um, but that's too long to explain here. But, you know, if you're interested in it, you can Google Protection Poker, Lori Williams, and you'll find out that methodology. Okay. Well, so, Aaron, out of, out of curiosity, I mean, have you, in your analysis, have you seen that there's differences in developer behavior from, uh, in terms of the highly risky behavior between sort of big IT systems or embedded systems, uh, interpreted versus compiled. And, and that might uh, suggest, you know, areas that the attackers are trying to target more. So have you, are there differences that your team has observed there as you guys have done analysis? Great question. So we've primarily been focused more on um, web stuff so far, but and honestly, that seems to be where a good number of these hacks have come from, at least in the sort of taxonomy of things that people have identified um, in the past. I think that it's going to be pretty interesting as, you know, we dig a bit more into some of those other ecosystems to see how some of those, uh, how some of those surfaces actually look under the hood. Um, okay. Oh, that makes sense. Um, so, uh, and then have you, so um, automation uh, has come up uh, frequently uh, over the course of the week. And is there, are there things in your, you know, trade, maybe to you, are there automated tools that if you know, if some, if a CISO called you and said, hey, you know, I want to, I want to use open source, but I want to, 
do it right. Like, you know, are there tools that, you know, you would recommend to them or, or are there, is it, is it simple practices and processes? How, how would you, rec, you know, lay out a series of recommendations for somebody there? So I'll defer to, to Lori and Aaron on particular products and services. I mean, I think the, the big thing that we found out of the report was a visibility and awareness is independent from mitigation. Um, you know, as we've already heard in the discussion, prioritization has to be part of that decision-making pipeline. Um, but one of the things that was, I guess, at least for me, was most noteworthy is in thinking about the open source attack surface, part of the challenge that um, many developers are running into is that as they're, as they're using major cloud platforms and as they're trying to implement these sort of best practices and standards, you know, the NIST documentation, for example, and NIST does really good work in this area, but these, many of these standard stocks are produced in PDF and they give you a, a hundred page document and a series of bullet points about all the things that you should do. And it's tricky to be diplomatic, to build that into a development workflow. Um, and so one of the big things that we call out in the piece and that we're, we're trying to work on now with some of the partners that we have on this project is how do you take those standards for secure development, secure lifecycle management and build those into a, a developer's uh, workflow into an automated set of tools. Um, where can the cloud providers, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Google, come out and provide a very easy reference implementation for their products that would implement that sort of um, secure lifecycle management pipeline. And so I think there's, you know, in some ways for organizations, there's ways to address this with existing tooling, but there's a, there's a farther up the chain question, right? About how do you make it just dead simple for developers to push secure code to notify customers and to maintain that over the life cycle, make it as easy as possible to do what we've identified as best practice, not to come up with novel uh, technologies and solutions, but but to, again, defer to Lori or Aaron, I think they're real experts in this space for specific products or services. So just to piggyback on that, I can say from our perspective uh, and you know, even to just add on to, to Lori's point before, one thing that we put a lot of effort toward is to you know, provide more tangible risk scoring of results that we produce. Um, because just in surveying a lot of people as we've developed the product, we've seen a lot of discussion around how you know, most of them have the same essential pain point. They give tons of results and it's difficult to say without going through every single one of them you know, where the actual real issues lie. Yeah. Um, yeah, to, I guess to add on to that, um, you know, looking at the results in front of me of a, a large project that we did and, it, you know, from a tool standpoint, it was buzzing versus static analysis versus um, IAST, in, in, um, interactive application security testing. And by, you know, orders of magnitude. So say the static analysis tools found hundreds of vulnerabilities um, and the others found tens of vulnerabilities. So orders of magnitude. Um, but as I mentioned before, a typical developer won't really take the static analysis tool results so um, seriously. And, you know, so if we can get to the point where we know which static analysis, you know, is more like really more likely to be a true positive. And the other thing I'll say about this study that we just finished is with these hundreds, um, you know, I had graduate students went and, and they checked true and false positives. So they, you know, the false positive rate is much higher than it used to be. It's in the nineties, true positive, where it used to be like 10% true positive. So the tool vendors have gotten much better at, getting true positives, but yet like developers want to know, is this exploitable or not? And um, so we need to get to the point where this, you know, they really trust that severity score as being like, this is actually something that we need to take um, in seriously. The other thing about the, um, so like Zap is a fuzzer, open source fuzzer, um, very easy to use. And it found I would say the same-ish number of what you would consider exploitable vulnerabilities as a commercial tool that was 20 or 30 times harder to use. So the difficulty of using a tool, you know, matters as well. But but I guess bottom line is, you know, from a number standpoint, static analysis is um, the most, but not not considered that serious by developers. So. Um... Trey, uh, another question for the audience from you. And also, um, uh, just as a reminder, you know, if anyone in the audience has questions and would like to, to 
you know, either raise their hand or uh, put them in the Q and A. Um, so please, uh, please do so. Um, you know, a couple of questions, uh, Trey. You know, what risks or threats have you guys seen? Is it credible risk or threat around SDKs? You know, being compromised in the supply chain. Yeah, this is a really fun vector. Um, is it sort of the you know the the compromise that launches a thousand later attacks? So the the thinking is that you compromise the um, code of the developer base for a software development kit. And and so there's actually an example that we profile in the paper um, attacking Xcode in 2015, such that subsequent apps developed with this software um, were themselves vulnerable. And so the attackers were able to load in. Um, I think, again, in a couple of cases, it was crypto mining. But in every case, there was um, a significant espionage component baked into that. And this is you know, uh, example, right? Software like WeChat uh, or WinZip. It's not not small flashlight um, programs. I mean, it was significant code. The the SDK in this case was available on um, one of Baidu's uh, file sharing websites, and so it wasn't something that came out of the core Apple repository, uh, but it was available to developers who wanted to pull it down um, and sideload it. So that's an attractive attack surface because of the potential scalability of that initial compromise in an area talking about supply chain risk where there's already a, a huge scaling factor uh, from these initial attacks. One of the things to note about it is the way that, especially when we're talking about open source, it's, it's positive and it's a recurring trend that people are trying to make software development more accessible and to make these sorts of inter-platform products easier to build that, that folks don't have to uh, you know, learn a specific language to work on um, a single operating system. The challenge though, is that those products become more and more complex. And so developer tools go from being kind of simple hacks and, and you know, basic parts of a tool chain into complex interdependent sort of platforms in and of themselves. And as that happens, this prospect for compromise and, and for compromise to go undetected grows over time. So I, I would be thinking about, you know, we're talking about it here. Um, I think we've referenced it a few times, right? The maturity of these products as they hit a certain threshold uh, you know, in the complexity of the code base and the wide, uh, the breadth of their use, right, deserve additional scrutiny or potential resources um, to try and evaluate the security of those products because they have this potential, um, potentially significant upstream value for attackers. Yeah, no, um, the, what I've seen from attacker behavior is they want to, you know, take, take what you think your greatest strength is and they will figure out how to turn that into their super highway. So, um, you know, one uh, a kind of a general question for everybody, um, and then we will, uh, you know, kind of ask for some, some individual sort of closing thoughts from everybody, but and, and until uh, another audience, audience question comes in, but, you know, what happens in a 5G world if we don't get uh, software supply chains right? Uh, so maybe, Lori, if you could kick us off there in the 5G universe, what are we staring at? Yeah, um, I don't know. I can't. I mean, 5G is so prevalent that it will be so prevalent that anything that happens will have much greater spread. But I don't personally see it I mean, as any different, except that the implications will be much, much greater. So, Aaron, what are your? No, no. What are your thoughts, Aaron? So, you know, just to kind of add to that, I, I think the problem is already there. And it continues to grow at uh, at an increasing rate, and you know, five G is only going to accelerate that because more people are going to be downloading more software. Um, there's going to be you know, a, an even worse signal to noise ratio in terms of being able to track down things like you know network traffic anomalies and things like that. Um, so I would anticipate that the situation is probably going to get worse. Yeah, and for. Um... Trey, uh, Trey, go ahead, and then there, I can throw in some, a couple of comments we've seen from other discussions this week. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say, I think the thing that's interesting from the software supply chain standpoint about 5G is the degree to which this telecommunications industry is becoming a software industry. Um, you know, the, the move for um, major hyperscale cloud providers to start offering the majority of the back end, you know, core network management um, and traffic management services that used to be the domain for 3G or 4G services, um, of an AT&T, right, of a, of a classic telecommunications provider. 
um, to the point where you could see a, a cloud provider building the compute storage and networking that facilitates a 5G network all the way up to the point where there's a, a hardware antenna and even potentially past that. Um, you know, means that you've got a new set of companies engaging in uh, telecommunications risk and engaging in a regulated industry, which, you know, given that we're, we're sort of somehow locused around DC for part of this conversation is not insignificant. The only other thing I'd tag on that, and, and I guess part of our drumbeat with the policy community in thinking about 5G and software is, if this is the case that you've got cloud companies in this market and that you're virtualizing hardware functions, your attack surface is now significantly more software than hardware. So for all of the discussion in the policy ecosystem about semiconductor manufacturing and who's building our radios and where are they coming from, like realistically, who's running your firmware and who is writing the orchestration software that keeps all of these different net, you know, now virtualized network functions singing in harmony and talking with each other and, and, and working in a relatively secure fashion. That's a really significant attack surface that I think we're gonna see people exploit before there's really strong um, policy response to defend, but is this really kind of intriguing open area, right? Where in, in people's minds still telecommunications is a radio tower somewhere, when realistically now it's it's a lot of core and back-end compute. Well, and and with the with 5G being uh, something that's going to require, you know, orders of magnitudes more stations than 4G, the, what that means is you're going to, you're millions and millions of towers, not thousands or hundreds of thousands. It's going to be millions and they're not going to be uh, locked away as well, physically separated from attackers. They're going to be much closer to, to people and much the, so the physical threat to the devices, the physical ability to, to get close to them and, and uh, you know, do something nefarious to them is much higher. You don't have to you're not going to have to break into towers to do it. So, um, no, it's, it's a highly scalable threat with, you know, access points that are highly accessible. So, um, you know, Lori, if maybe you could give us some thoughts, what in this domain around software supply chain security, what, what research or is your team undertaking over the, you know, coming months or years in this space? Yeah, um, so what we're working on now, um, you know, we're continuing to do these um, comparisons on vulnerability discovery um, between tools and, you know, I, I mentioned several of them, we'll add you know, runtime protection, which is not really vulnerability discovery in that we don't, you don't detect the vulnerability, you just detect that, something happens, but also symbolic execution, which we haven't um, put in there. So um, our studies so far have been Java-based, we're moving into C and C++-based, um, and the, you know, the one thing, one aspect of it is so far we've been focusing on discovery of vulnerabilities and not on um, fixing. And so like if the winner, quote unquote, is penetration testing or fuzzing, once you get that result, fixing it from that standpoint can take tens of hours. Uh, and so, you know, the, the next paper is called vulnerability discovery is just the beginning. And we'll be comparing um, the fixed time based upon the type of tool um, that you know that you're focused on. So you know we're working on on that. Um, let's see, you know some of the other things that are different, like so extracting cyber threat intelligence from popular press art, like the, the press, like available, like what are attackers actually doing? So that we can then fold that into like security requirements and security testing. Um, also, uh, looking at um, systematizing penetration testing, which like it's it's inevitable. I mean, penetration testing is um, the thing that everybody does. And so one one result that was really interesting to me is in my class last year, uh, or actually earlier this year. So it was master students starting out with very, very little security expertise. So we, um, we started the class and asked them that question. And then, so it was just one semester class. Um, and at the end of it, we ran an exercise where they had to, for three hours, just do penetration testing and tape themselves. So like they had to make a video that would say, now I'm gonna go to the name field and I'm gonna try to type in something. And they annotated it and um, we, the class was built around a resource that I would really highlight for anyone, OWASP, ASVS, Application Security Verification Standard, which is a, a set of you know, 150 or something like that. 
different security aspects that you should test for. And so the whole class, you know, when, when anything, you know, when every assignment, if they found a, a bug from a fuzzer, I would say, okay, report the bug and then go to the ASVS and say, which control in the ASVS would this be related to? And so we really pushed them to understand all of the dimensions of um, security that are outlined in this ASVS document. And those students meet all the tools so, you know, in this particular product, which is OpenMRS, in three hours, they found 192 real vulnerabilities in an actual product that, you know, an electronic medical record system that's being used, 192 unique vulnerabilities in three hours spread across 38 CWE types. And so to me, the only way they did that was me pushing them and pushing them back to this ASVS document so I, I highly advocate to everyone who's listening, go check that document out. And you know, when you're doing your own security testing, push yourself to get as many dimensions as possible from that standard. Oh, thank you, Laura. That's those are great insights. Uh, great tool. Um, Aaron, um, where uh, you said that you'd started on the interpreted side, that or uh, the web website. That's where where Phylum has. Uh, started where are you guys uh going in the you know the near future on you know the compiled side or in the embedded side what what's phylum's uh target space there in the coming months great question so we started out kind of on the interpreted language side but over the next i'd say six months or so we're going to be vastly expanding that to uh cover most of the other big language ecosystems um you know essentially just to kind of add on to add on to that, you know, the attack surface really is much larger than just the source code. So, you know, that's a that's a big dimension of what we're looking at now. Um, so, you know, author risk is a big part of what we're analyzing, and you know, things like um, metadata and statistics about the source repositories themselves and sort of their histories. Uh, that's that's awesome and those being able to you know affirmatively um you know document uh, that that data for your your CISO about why you have confidence that things haven't been surreptitiously added would be would be a, a compelling thing to be able to put on the table so trey um you know the the cyber state care has an issue where what areas of focus do you guys see uh undertaking in this domain over the coming you know months or years yeah so probably we're, we're trying to figure out exactly which of the you know of the many areas to take the software supply chain discussion would be most interesting but i think three are most likely um one is looking at uh firmware lifecycle security for secure secure co-processors um and all of the uh, process integrity tools like SGX that are out there, the, the way that those um, that those features are written and supported and tokenized, especially in the case of SGX, is a really interesting um, piece of attack surface for the cloud providers. Um, second is taking a harder look at firmware and cloud workload security from the software supply chain framing. Uh, so trying to dive into a more, I'd say, a less data rich and, and more opaque space, uh, but but realistically one that's a big part of uh, most organizations threat model. Um, and the third actually is interesting listening to Aaron's discussion, we want to take a look at open source uh, repository management. So one of the recommendations from the initial report was it's not unreasonable to expect that if you're operating a GitHub or a, a source forge, um, both for binaries, but also for containers and container registries, that you're offering some sort of reasonably low baseline of features or tools to folks that are putting code on your platform to support that code and throughout its entire life cycle that you're making again as easy as possible for them to do the right things um, in patching rapidly and notifying users um, as well as securing their accounts with multi-factor authentication and sort of basic hygiene and so uh, one of the things that we're exploring is is can we build out the data set to justify the the cost of that uh, kind of requirement to see if there might be the possibility for some sort of voluntary code of practice uh, before there's a strong policy response um, and to understand, I think that that that's an attack surface that um, we can better manage, right? That there are some choke points in that ecosystem that we can address. And I think it's interesting to see, you know, listening to Lori's discussion reminded, right, of the DARPA 
challenge, um, right? I think of the, of the two winning teams, CMU and UVA, one was very offensive. One, one was focused much more on vulnerability mitigation. So it's interesting, right? Thinking through this life cycle, just how hard it is to try to hit discovery, mitigation, management, all these different phases of the life cycle. So I think that's going to be overarching theme for us is trying to understand, um, you know, where do we need resources? Where should there be more public money put into the open source ecosystem? Uh, where should incentives be changed? And maybe where do there need to be a few uh, coercive tools from the policy space to get people moving in the right direction? Well, I, I just I want to say thanks uh, to everybody. Thanks to the audience for their um, the questions. Um, we've we've enjoyed working with with each of your organizations, and we we hope to you know do a lot more of it over the coming uh, you know coming months and years. And so, thank you very much. Um, and if there you know I had, didn't see any uh, other questions, um, but uh, thank you very much. And so everybody have a you know I hope. Cyber Week was great for everybody, um, and I will uh, I'll put my contact in the chat just uh, in case there are follow-up questions. Um, but other than that, um, thank you very much.